that's why indie musicians do so well in sync. And it's still kind of like their world because if they have their housekeeping in order, meaning they know where all the bodies are buried um, <laughs> or they, they wrote and recorded their song, they're likely going to get a sync over maybe somebody who has like 16 writers and, right. you know, et cetera. I always love being able to represent both sides of music because it makes it more what we deem more clearable in sync because the less parties you have to to get in contact with to clear something the easier it is to license it right so artists that we work with they really want to win in this space but maybe they worked with a co-writer that signed to a major publisher and they're playing a different game this is when uh it's the most frustrating for me and also the most frustrating for my artists because you know, there are partners and I want to see them succeed. And when an artist can't feed themselves and they're living paycheck to paycheck, you know, a $5,000 placement can make a really big difference in their lives. And um, it's not something to poo-poo, in my opinion. What's going on? Welcome to the new music business. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, the book. Third edition is out everywhere now. Audiobook, ebook, hardcover book, however you like to consume your books, you can find the book wherever you get books. Today, my guest is Jessica Vaughn. Now, Jess wears many hats in the industry. She is an artist. She's a songwriter. She actually has one of those nifty uh, songwriter profiles on Spotify because she's written for so many other artists. And, and she has many artist projects and has had countless sync placements uh, with her own music and songs that she's written and performed on. She has the artist projects Laces, Jay Poland, Charlotte Sometimes, just to name a few of them. And she has had many other releases just for, for other artists. But currently today, Today, what we're mostly discussing is her role as head of sync at Venice Music. Um, and she also is the president of Head Bitch Music, which is a uh, kind of indie label as well. And um, she, so she's, we, we cover all of this in, in the conversation, but the, the primary focus of this conversation is sync. And, uh, you know, her experience in sync, not only placing her own music, now head of sync at uh, Venice, she's landed placements in uh, Super Bowl spots uh, with the NFL, ESPN, the CW, Netflix, Hulu, CBS, MTV, VH1, BET, Disney Plus, Peacock. I mean, you name it. It's just pretty much everybody she's worked with and, and gotten songs placed uh, from her artists um, and for herself and all of that stuff. So we really cover um, the whole kind of sync realm right now is, is where we're at. Um it's changed quite a bit, uh, you know, but where we're at kind of midway through 2023. And so we had a very fascinating conversation. We even got into AI um, and how AI music is going to affect uh, sync. We talked about the the writers and actors strike uh, happening right now and, and you know, what musicians and songwriters can can kind of do and, and what to look out for in contracts and how to negotiate. And then we, we break it down. We, you know, we go very into the weeds, very deep, very specific with how licensing works, how music supervisors uh, want to be contacted, can be contacted, uh, where to find them, who to talk to, who are the ones that want to be contacted, who are the ones that don't. We talk a bit about how licensing works and breakdown of royalties, and we talk about how the specifics of licensing works with the master and the publishing and all that stuff. But then we, we zoom out to the 30,000 foot view and we talk about the state of the industry and where we're heading. So this is a, a very fascinating conversation. We went on a few tangents. Jessica is a, uh, a brilliant mind in the industry, an executive now in the industry. And I was so thrilled to get to chat with her on record. Uh, we've chatted a bunch at conferences and, and other stuff you know, off the record uh, over the years. And so um, it was great to kind of catch up in this more formal setting. You can find Venice Music on Instagram and uh, venicemusic.co. You can find Jessica Vaughn 
on Instagram and um, on all the socials. On um, You can find Head Bitch Music on Instagram as well. You can find uh, her also on LinkedIn and on Twitter. Um, you can find all of us that make the show happen at Ari's Take on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and Threads. Are we still calling it Twitter? Are we calling it X? I've lost track. I don't really know what's happening in Musk's brain right now. So I, I don't know. We, we find us in that platform formerly known as Twitter with the bluebird. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, we're there. You can find me at Ari Herstand on uh, Instagram and uh, threads. Visit Ari'sTake.com. Get on the email list. That's where we send out the most important up-to-date information about the new music business. Go to Ari'sTake.com. But right now, just, just pause the episode, hit subscribe, hit follow, leave us a five-star review. Uh, however you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening, give us a thumbs up on YouTube, all that good stuff. All right, let's kick into the show. Jessica Vaughn, welcome to the show. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, you are a very fascinating uh, person to me in the industry as a fellow artist, songwriter, slash kind of industry person, executive, just wearing all these different hats. Um, and over the years, you know, I, I'm not, I don't, I, we don't have time, unfortunately, to get into your entire backstory, which you've had like, 12 different careers up until this point but but they all as i was going through this they all make perfect sense to me and they like in the, this like trajectory makes a lot of sense but like i want to focus more like right now where we're at present day because i think that's um incredibly interesting and specifically in the sync licensing realm because that's what you've been specializing in for for so long um and and you're kind of your new well not actually, I guess, new anymore, but role at Venice as kind of their head of sync. Um, so why don't you just like start off by just telling us about kind of what your current day to day is uh, in all capacities, you know, and so if, if laces slips into that a bit a songwriting, you know, the release schedule, all of that, I'm curious, like in this moment where we're at in, you know, uh, nearly August 2023, like, what are you doing on a day to day basis? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, I ask myself that every day. <laughs> um, <laughs> so right now, I'm the head of sync at Venice. Mm -hmm. uh, music, which is a distribution company. We offer uh, high-level services, strategy, distro, and sync. Um, mm -hmm. So I run that department globally. Um, and then I'm also president of my own company called Head Bitch Music, because I don't want there to be any confusion. I am the head bitch. Um, <laughs> and we also have a label imprint. We do custom music, um, as well as my husband's management company. is also a DBA off of Head Bitch. Mm -hmm. um and your husband also... ryan vaughn who is yeah. uh going to be our next guest on the new music <laughs> business podcast so stick yeah. around for that but yes continue <laughs> yeah we we like to keep it a family business uh -huh. um and then we also do a ton of uh songwriting under hbm as well so i am a <clears throat> a still a professional songwriter i have mm -hmm. many artist projects so um my day-to-day -day looks different every day. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned custom music. What does that mean? Yeah, so bespoke music. So like, um, I work with Hasbro, the toy company and Fox and Paramount and Boxine. And what we do is that we create music um, based on their specifications. So maybe that's for a show, maybe that's for a toy or a product, maybe it's for a commercial. Hmm. Um, but people come to us to kind of problem solve their music needs and it looks different depending on the project. Give me an example. Yeah. So right now we're, we just released the My Little Pony EP for their, I think it was their 40th anniversary. And so we did a bunch of reimagined themes of, uh, you know, the main eighties theme. So we have like a nineties girl pop version. We had an acoustic version an eighties remix. So, um, they came to us to kind of uh, figure that out with them. And uh, another example is a uh, box sign. There's a toy called Tony's and there's, it's a, a screenless speaker box and little toys go on it. And there's uh, albums worth of music on the toys. And we're responsible for creating original music as well as uh, the covers for uh, the toy. 
Cool. And when you say we, uh, specifically, what does that mean? Yeah, so I have a team of amazing um, up and coming and, you know, very professional uh, singers, songwriters, producers um, that I have worked with, trained them. Um, and so it's me as well as um, this amazing group of uh, a lot of amazing women and a lot of amazing men. Um, because apparently I cannot be everywhere all at once, even though I try to be. <laughs> right. So, so Hasbro will come to you and they say, okay, we're doing this My Little Pony, um, you know, anniversary special thing. We'd like to turn it into an EP. Can you, Jessica, yeah. help us with that? And you're like, yes, I totally can. Then you go yeah. back to your team. You're like, all right, guys, this is what we need to do. And uh, I think I can sing this one, but like my voice wouldn't maybe uh, isn't connecting good so much for this like 80s remix one. So why don't you sing yeah. this one? And like maybe you're the best producer for this. Is that kind of, so you're almost kind of like A&Ring the project like you're running a, a yes. production company or something? Yes, it's very much yeah. uh, creative direction, A&R and cool. curation. Um, and cool. so I'm always on the side of how do we get the best possible product and mm. uh, it doesn't always involve me as much as like I think as a former artist you, you know I or I guess I'm still an artist but you know doing the whole song and dance um right. I think that that's <laughs> can be challenging um when you're first starting out and now I look at it as an opportunity and um it's so fun to be able to create like actual monetary wins for my friends and the people that are up and coming. How do, is this considered these, this relationship with Hasbro and, and these other toy companies and all of that? And I don't, I, I don't know how the licensing works in this capacity. Is it similar to sync where they're going to pay you kind of an upfront fee for these songs that's going to be placed inside the toys slash they might probably want to use it for maybe commercials or something like that or, or what are these licensing what are these deal if it even is a license like what does it look like yeah i mean every project requires a different set of licensing or buyout or an exchange of rights um mm -hmm. and that's always i think no matter what you do the rights that you exchange are always up to negotiation i always mm -hmm. wear my licensing brain no matter where I am and what I'm working on. Mm -hmm. um, so if there is a play to be able to license a song, if we're creating it from scratch, um, I'm always going to want to try to retain some of those rights, but sometimes it's not possible. So mm -hmm. um, it just depends on the relationship and what they're going to be using the songs for. Mm -hmm. um, and that can change. So uh, I wouldn't say I'm responsible to do any of the music supervision, though, if I am, let's say, doing a cover of a song, I don't have to be the one to license that when right. I'm doing um, custom music. That being said, like when I'm working at Venice, I've definitely have worked with major brands and we're making music with our artists that's original. And a lot of times that will be a licensing term. Um, and I try to keep that down to a year and then keep, you know, retain those rights. Um, because usually the artists and the company are taking on the liability. Right. So that's if something happens. <laughs> Right. So, so, okay. So let's talk about your role at, at Venice and kind of head of sync there. And you're essentially, uh, correct if I'm wrong, but it, it sounds like you're kind of acting as a sync agent and you have, is that, is that, is that correct in that like you yeah, have artists? I, yeah. I guess so. I mean, I, I always feel like the word agent is just reminds me of like these huge agencies and I don't feel like a used car salesman, no offense what? to anybody who does sales, <laughs> but okay. um, I'm not like, hello, my name's Jessica Baum on a future yeah, license yeah. from us. <laughs> um, I, I feel like I'm not wheeling and dealing. I'm really listening to the artists that we have. Where's our catalog? What's missing in our catalog? What are my clients consistently coming to me for? Um, and how can I better support the artist and communicate and translate the needs of my clients. Um, so clients? at Venice, yeah, I mean, they range. I handle all media. So film, TV, advertising, and gaming, and I run the department globally. So okay. um, everyone. 
but just but, but like I, specifically for people that aren't really familiar with this uh realm of the industry when you say film tv so I, i'm just gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna force you to get specific in a lot of these areas just because it helps illustrate what we're talking about for people that aren't really familiar yeah, with yeah, this yeah. so uh a client might be netflix a client might be hb or well, max i guess yeah, now so or Fox a streamers or, yeah okay. so streamers Got streamers it. are like hulu hbo max yeah. um you know, uh, Netflix, et cetera, Amazon Prime. Uh -huh. um, but then you have your network TV like CBS, um, ABC, NBC. Uh -huh. um, and then you have films and that could be like huge th theatrical releases or it could be an indie release or, you know, a film festival circuit. And then sure. you have advertising and you're either mm -hmm. working directly with the brand or an agency that supports um, the brand. So for example, there's plenty of huge uh, huge brands that work with outside music supervision companies that will be the ones who are actually sourcing and licensing and negotiating the music on their behalf. Mm. Um, and then you have gaming and that can be in the game or it could be maybe a trailer around the game or a promo um, or their gaming radio. So there's a lot of different things and they all require the same rights, but they all kind of have different terms to the deal and different fees that are associated with that style of media. And so the client, because they're the ones essentially like signing the contract and, and paying you the money for these upfront uh, fees and, and dealing with the licensing and stuff like that. But, but really the people that you're working with, you mentioned music supervisors, where do they mm -hmm. fall into uh, all of this? Yeah, I would say similar to my position, which is, you know, I'm going to be pitching the music and negotiating the terms of that agreement or that license on behalf of the artist. For me, I work with the sound recording or the master rights of a song because I work for a distribution company. Um, I'm the middleman, right? Like I'm not the artist. Mm -hmm. um, I am basically the delivery system and the negotiator on their behalf. I'm the artist representative. And then you have the music supervisors and they're the representative of their client. Maybe it's a production company, maybe it's a brand, maybe it's a game, and that can look differently. So it's their responsibility to kind of, what is the budget for this specific media or this specific use? Mm -hmm. um, what kind of music is my client looking for? How can I negotiate the best deal? Mm -hmm. um, how can I make sure that they're not gonna have a headache? So they're really also middlemen. So we're both kind of coming together, working out a deal that is fair or we deem fair to both parties. And then we try to lock and load that. And sometimes music supervisors will also have somebody else clear for them or maybe the company they work for will clear it. But they are responsible for, you know, kind of helping source that music. Um, I think that there's a lot of confusion about that with music supervisors and um just like anything in business, some some people have more power and some people don't, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people think, oh, Jess is really going to get my song into this in this TV show. But I'm always at the mercy of, of my client what works for their narrative. Does the mm -hmm. song work for their narrative? Does it lift it up or does it distract? Um, does it fit within their budget? I can get it in front of the supervisors, but then the supervisor has to also deem the same things to be true. And then they have to give it to them their client and the client goes, actually, I'm going to license my nephew's song. So, you know, it, <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> there's a lot that goes into it. And some music Hollywood nepotism at its finest. Uh, yeah, can never avoid yeah. it. Yeah. Even in sync. Right. <laughs> even in sync. And some supervisors, you know, they're a part of the uh, production and they might have a, um, a bigger voice in the, the choosing or the selection of the music. But that's not always the case. And uh, so I think, again, we, we're all just kind of working together and, and maybe taking away the fantasy that everyone's going to save you is uh, would be yeah. helpful for everyone. No, it's great. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And it's really uh, helpful perspective, uh, especially for artists to understand the process that it that, you know, there is no one God that's part of this. I, I think a lot of people either look at, you know, people like you, the, the sync. I call them agents, but I know whatever you want to call it, you know, um, or like the music supervisors are like the people that hold the keys to the universe or they, they have the, the full authority to do anything. But really, you know, sure, you pitch the songs you think are best 
based on what their needs are. Then they pick the songs that they think are best from what they've been pitched based on what their needs are. But then they still, there's this whole jury of people like the director or the producers or the studio or the ad company, like, uh, like you mentioned, um, that also have to sign off on it. I mean, you know, uh, my, my wife, um, is an artist uh, who, you know, and, and, uh, she was in the running. She had this song, um, that was pitched, cleared, licensed contracts were signed for now this was a couple of years ago um this was a, a national ad campaign for the vaccine this was going to be like the united states official commercial rolling out everywhere to try to promote the vaccine be like all right it's amazing. safe it's here it's ready to go <laughs> and it was a hilarious and amazing commercial it was so good and it was her song and it was her voice and she wrote it and it was all and they sent they sent her the actual final edit the cut they're like and it was like wednesday it's like all right it's airing friday and we're like, oh, oh my gosh, we did. This is incredible. It's great. So Friday, we're like, you know, flipping the channels, trying to like, when is this getting looking on YouTube? Like, where is this airing? Why isn't this up? We can't find it. And then we hear the next day that someone at the very, 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 very top of the government was like, oh, I don't like that one lyric in this part here. No, we got to scrap the whole thing. I'm killing it. We're pulling it. Yeah. And we're like, what? So it's like, even at that stage, there's people behind the curtain that you don't even know about and you know yeah. and then she never got paid of course because it didn't air you don't get paid it's uh it's pretty <laughs> wild and depending on what the terms of the uh the deal were, was and what the license says you know sure. they probably protected themselves so they didn't have to didn't pay have her to pay. <laughs> um yeah. but you know i try to avoid that um but i will say <laughs> that when artists ask me that they're, they're like okay so like the quote happened so like When's it going to air? And I'm like, right. well, maybe. Yeah. I was like, as soon as I know, you'll know. But I probably won't know because they probably won't tell me. And then I just have to Google and look. And then I <laughs> listen and I watch everything. And I'm like, so it looks like it's confirmed because right. we don't always get the confirmation from our clients. And I think, you know, why that seems so insane. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it happens more on the TV side. It's not going to happen happen on the advertising side really because it moves so quickly and there's just a lot a lot more that goes into that but sure. with tv they have so much content they're responsible let's say it's back to back wall-to-wall -wall music in a show let's say there's like a hundred songs they mm -hmm. have to reach out to all of the rights holders um before it airs the likelihood of that happening while they're also licensing a song and quoting on other episodes is low, right? It's right. probably, they're probably behind. So sometimes we'll get a confirmation, maybe the day of, maybe a week later. Um, luckily, I'm pretty on top of it because I understand mm -hmm. what that feels like, not knowing that your song got confirmed and it's on TV and you yeah. are not prepared to support it. <laughs> so right. I really try to, I empathize with that. So I really uh, try to over communicate. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it can happen. And sometimes it's like, you know, you get a confirmation and they can still like change their mind. So it's, it's not a sure thing until something airs. And mm -hmm. I wish I had better answers to give to creators, but I don't, the world's corrupt. Yay. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> I, uh, I mean, in the past I've gotten texts from friends who were watching a show in real time. You're like, I think I hear your song on this. I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> nobody told me this like i knew i was maybe in the running but like come on communication people but like it makes yeah. sense right with with shows like that that are you know um yeah just placing music so frequently so i want to go back to something yeah. you mentioned a little while ago you yeah. um and just to break this down a little bit uh you mentioned master rights and that you yeah. are only really representing the master rights uh within venice because venice uh is a distribution company um, so you're only dealing with the master rights and you're not dealing with the publishing, with the songwriting side of this equation. Can you talk about what that that means more specifically, but also maybe some of the challenges that go into this just yeah. just representing the master, like you said? Yeah, um, 100 percent. I always love being able to represent both sides of music because it makes it more what we deem more clearable in sync because the less parties you have to 
uh, to get in contact with to clear something, the easier it is to license it, right? So that's why- Both I sides mean master and publishing. The master and the publishing. Got it. And yeah. I would say that's why indie musicians do so well in sync. And it's still kind of like their world because if they have their housekeeping in order, meaning they know where all the bodies are buried um, <laughs> or they, they wrote and recorded their song, they're likely going to get a sync over maybe somebody who has like 16 writers and, right. you know, et cetera. So, uh, like I said, I work for a distribution company, so we release sound recordings, right? So sound recordings, um, master recordings, um, it's my responsibility to negotiate on the behalf of the artist or the rights holder on mm -hmm. the sound recording side. Um, it's a little bit easier, in my opinion, to do that than on the publishing side, because usually publishing is much more complicated. I worked for a publisher, so in sync, so that is where I came from, which makes working with the sound recording a little bit easier for me. I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, really? You don't have to do all this stuff? I still do all of it. And by doing all of it is that there is no sync if not all parties clear the song. So let's say I have 100% of the master or control of 100% of the master for synchronization purposes, mm -hmm. but there are three writers and they have three different publishers on the publishing side equal splits. Um, I need to know who the writers are. I need to know who the publishers are, their point of contact. Um, if they have any like thresholds that they won't clear for anything under this amount of money, et cetera. Mm. Um, maybe they don't want to have their music be used in certain ways. Um, and if I don't know that I might pitch to like a target ad or something and they hate Target. They hate commercialism. <laughs> right. And they're not going to clear it. Um, that means there is no sync. And if no mm. one can get in contact with the other writers or the other publishers, then, um, you know, all that work that I have done or negotiated will be, won't be able to be used. Um, also, there's always MFN, Most Favored Nations. Um, usually, we always go MFN with the publishers. Um, uh, just to explain that, that means that if the publisher gets to, ne they negotiate a rate because uh, just just to break it down, the uh, the people who control the the master side, like you, uh, and the people that control the publishing side, the publishers, they're going to be negotiating independently with the clients, like we call them, you know, the the um, the studios or the TV shows, or the music supervisors, the, those people, yeah. and independently. So if the publishers secure like a hundred thousand dollars for their side and you've only secured fifty thousand dollars because you didn't know what their negotiations were going most favorite nations means they're going to honor that because they're paying this side a hundred thousand they're yeah. also going to up your rate to a hundred thousand as well is that that's correct that's correct and that can be you know sometimes it can be challenging um you know working for more of an indie company where we're more flexible with our terms because the artists that we work with they really want to win in this space but maybe they worked with a co-writer that signed to a major publisher and they're playing a different game, mm. right? Because maybe it looks like small, like, you know, it's, it's pennies to them in comparison to maybe a Beyonce that they have. And right. um, therefore they can't allocate their time to negotiate on behalf of that license if they don't feel like it's worth their time monetarily. So um, this is when, uh, it's the most frustrating for me and also the most frustrating for my artists because, you know, there are partners and I want to see them succeed. And I, I definitely have been signed to major companies and um, they have messed up, you know, licensing deals that I've wanted to do because they didn't think it was worth their time. And, you know, I, I'm sure there's a valid point there, but when an artist can't feed themselves and they're living paycheck to paycheck, you know, a $5,000 placement can make a really big difference in their lives. And um, it's not something to poo-poo, in my opinion. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I mean, that is an argument for artists staying independent uh, and not signing these deals 
too soon in their career, whether it's a, a major publishing deal uh, or a, a major record deal. Um, because of that, I mean, specifically, like, you know, if you're if you're going to, to Sony Music too soon and they're not really looking at plate licenses under 50 grand or whatever it is. But like you said, like, you know, as an indie artist, indie song, like be thrilled to get a five thousand dollar placement, you know, just like keep them coming. Get let's get a bunch of them. But right. It's it's you know, there's a lot of people that are part of that discussion and, and that equation. Now, yeah. uh, we hear the term one stop thrown around a lot in the sync licensing yeah. space. And a lot of sync licensing companies or sync agents, um, you know, they deal uh, with, you know, they in one stop, meaning that they uh, control the rights to both sides, the master and the publishing, and they have now become a one stop, meaning the music supervisor doesn't have to make a bunch of stops around town. They only have to make one stop to the to the sync <laughs> agent, They're like, and yeah. they control, they've cleared, I guess, all of the rights from all parties. So even if there are 15 songwriters on this track, they've already cleared it with all so the so the music supervisor doesn't have to negotiate with 15 different publishers and the record label they don't have to spend all that time tracking down the songwriters it's literally like i can clear this today in 10 minutes if you want that's kind yeah. of why um we've seen a lot of these companies move to one stop is that something mm -hmm. that you are focusing on or venice has the ability to do yeah there's definitely we have a portion of our catalog that is one stop based off of my expertise coming from a publisher coming from the custom music world i know what that means i know the ease i know what my clients want um it's not something like venice or any distribution company has to do or even maybe want to do yeah. um but i don't mind the extra work if it means that i can land more wins um so a lot of the artists that we have you know especially our venice music collective uh, members, meaning they are in our membership tier. So they'll, they'll buy a membership to have access to certain services. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of them don't have a publishing, uh, you know, company. They're, they don't even have an administrator. They might not even have a publishing entity set up. Um, yeah. and so they might not be the best person to clear their own side of the publishing if they've never even looked at a license before and they might end up signing something that might be hurtful instead of helpful. Yeah. Um, so usually when I see that, when I see songs come in and I really believe in them, I'll also raise my hand and talk to the artist, say, hey, who's representing this? Would you like me to handle it on your behalf until you do sign a deal? I'd be happy mm -hmm. to help facilitate that for you because it's a win-win for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and the more content that gets created, the easier licensing needs to be because no one has the bandwidth, the teammates um, to be able to license at the rate that they're being asked to. Sure. Um, I want to kind of uh, zoom out a little bit and kind of talk about the state of sync licensing right now, mid 2023, uh, kind of strike aside uh for now and then we can we can talk about what's happening with with hollywood and uh how yeah. the strike is specifically affecting sync but let's just let's just i guess like rewind maybe a couple months pre-strike um i'm just curious um you as as someone who has has done this as an artist um and i'm assuming have successfully licensed your own music directly with music supervisors and um ad agencies when you're just and now uh kind of doing this for a lot of other artists when you're talking to music supervisors or just your colleagues in your your in the space are you seeing that artists are still able to pitch their music directly to music supervisors anymore or have you seen a, sh a change in the tides where music supervisors are are far more hesitant these days to work directly with artists because maybe they've been burned in the past because artists just are ignorant to the to the rights that are required to uh, license their own music. I'm just curious, like, what your take is on that right now? Um, I definitely see more of a hesitation to work directly with artists, not necessarily because the artists don't demand their respect and they don't want to, but because they don't have time to talk to uh, a ton of individuals. And so mm -hmm. it's easier to go to um, the representatives because they uh, represent a, a lot of music. And so they can kind of come, they can speak the language and get it done. Um, 
where, you know, with artists, they might not be uh, sending their music in a specific way that might be digestible. And then, you know, I think we were all victims to this where we get so many emails that we can't keep up with the amount that we're receiving. Um, so mm -hmm. you can't respond to everything. So I do see a lot of supervisors say like, okay, that's the one thing that has to go. Mm -hmm. Unless, you know, I definitely know a handful of supervisors that love working directly with artists and that's why they're in it. And they huh. very specifically say, hey, this is how you can pitch to me directly. Um, this is how I prefer to work. You know, I have uh, a friend who works pretty high up at the 20th century uh, studios and he like loves working directly with artists my first experience with him was him working directly with me as an artist. And now mm. I just happen to work in the industry. And he's like, uh, you know, but I think, <laughs> yeah, I right. think uh, <laughs> there's ways to do it. If a supervisor asks, then yeah. like, you know, and gives you a way to do it, then I say, do it, but assume that they don't want to receive mm. it. Um, and try to uh, respect their boundaries of how they like to be communicated to. I'm sure most of them have that information on their website. Definitely don't. I don't recommend ever sliding into people's DMs um, <laughs> and like ask. I mean, I hate it when people do it to me and they do it to yeah. me all day, every day. Artists that are, you know, signed to different companies, even artists that I work with constantly. If you want to talk to me, send me an email. I don't ignore it. Anybody. I will set up time with you if I feel like it's appropriate, but I definitely won't ignore your email unless you're rude. Um, and, <laughs> you know, so it's just like, I'm very clear. Like I'm on Instagram to like promote something every once in a while and to just look at memes. So mm -hmm. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to link to the music. I don't want to be asked the same question unless I specifically say my DMs are open to answer your questions. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so, <laughs> How would an artist, I guess, uh, I know everyone is is screaming this right now, listening uh, to this, and I'm, don't worry, everyone, I'm asking the question right now. How <laughs> would an artist find those music supervisors who are open and willing to receiving pitches directly from artists or who want to work directly yeah. with artists? Who's your person at 20th Century? I don't know. You don't need to name them. But like, you know, just in general, <laughs> yeah. what is the process that an artist can can go through to find these people who will work directly with them yeah. if they don't have a sync agent or someone like you? Yeah, I mean, go go on IMDb Pro. Like, you know, like find the music supervisors that are working on the content that you feel like your music is a perfect fit for. Mm -hmm. And like follow them on social media. Go to their website. Like everyone is a Google way. So, um, like Google them and, you know, you can check that out. Like, for example, like a Rob Lowry from like, um, sweater weather music, like he posts all the time on his Instagram and his Twitter. And he has like collaborative playlists that you can drop music in, cool. um, like Mason from song runner, like he posts briefs on his website. So again, like this wasn't necessarily even as a, you know, a sync mm. rep wasn't information that like I was privy to until I started following them. Right. Or until I started getting in touch with them. So, um, again, it's pretty clear if someone is, if they're not saying, send me something, then they don't want, then they likely mm. want you to leave them alone. Like if yeah. they have a private Instagram, they probably want you to go away. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's a, that's a really helpful tip. And that's really important. Like my, you know, I, I tell the story occasionally my first big sync that I got, uh, you know, way back about 10 years ago, um, was on One Tree Hill, uh, because I discovered that I'm like, okay, this show One Tree Hill is using music very similar to the kind of music that I make, uh, or people I didn't really I wasn't even watching the show, but people would tell me like, hey, One Tree, I'm discovering all this great new music from One Tree Hill, they, they play music very similar to you. And I was like, I didn't know anything about anything at that point. <laughs> um, and they're like, okay, you know, so I was thinking like, well, how do I get my music on one tree? Hill? I don't know. And so I'm like, Oh yeah, yeah. You know, at end of the show. They're like music supervisor, Lindsay Wolfington, like literally in the credits. I'm like, Oh, yeah. okay. So Lindsay, what that music, that's something to deal with music. And I was like, okay, Lindsay, what yeah. I'm looking her up, found her on Twitter and I followed her on Twitter. Mind you, this is, you know, 2010 or something. Um, <laughs> and I like, you know, she's tweeting. She's like, man, it's so hard to clear all this music within my budget. And I just like tweeted back at her, like, 
here's a freebie or whatever, you know? And like she, yeah. and then like five minutes later, she's like, I love it. And then we like took it off, you know, Twitter and we're emailing and like, you know, yeah. six months later, she sent me a contract and she's like, hey, we want to use uh, your song in this Tuesday's episode. I need this contract by, by 5 p.m. today. She did yeah. pay for it. There was a license. I did get a license fee for it. But it's like, you know, yeah, it was kind of this long game, but also just by following the people like that and, and like, you know. It's you all know. about building authentic relationships that aren't based in a transactional deal yeah. right off the bat. And I and that is where I see and, and, you know, I think I would, I feel the same way when people talk to me, like, uh, I want to work with people that I feel connected to that I want to help that yeah. treat me with respect, and don't want to use me for a thirsty decision for their survival. Like, sure. you know, I think I understand that desperation, I understand that thirstiness, but that is like, running a sprint, not running a marathon and your mm. career is a marathon. And so if you need to provide for yourself financially doing other things, um, while you get your housekeeping in order and while you build out that marathon of a career, that is so much more important than accidentally burning bridges and coming off as desperate because I think human nature just kind of recoils from that naturally. So, yeah. um, it's like a good sync song. If, uh, if there's a good sync song, it's going to make you feel something. You're not going to know it's a sync song. You're going to feel connected to a song, just mm. like a good advertisement. You're randomly crying. You don't know why. And all of a sudden you want McDonald's fries. Like whatever <laughs> it is, right. <laughs> you have to feel like it has to be based in something real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, the creative side of this and, and that you mentioned a sync song. Um, you know, there are um, what people might call sync artists um, and and just maybe maybe break that down a little bit. Like what might be considered a sync artist? What might be considered a sync song? I know you just said it's a good song, but 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 really, yeah. like, let's let's talk about that when you're when we're talking about sync and briefs and all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I guess the industry the sync world considers like a sync artist, uh, an artist that's not, I say in quotes, not real. I disagree, but we'll get there. Um, because they're basically creating music that is made for picture. So mm -hmm. made, made for picture, doesn't matter what media. And they might be using certain keywords that always work like it's new or let's go or I'm a boss. Together. Or, yeah. New day, uh, right. or, you know, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then having um, certain sonics in there that work well to support the narrative that's going on screen, whether that's peaks and valleys, vocalese, non-lyrical vocals, um, clear edit points, maybe 30 second to 60 second kind of um, moments in your song. Um, and maybe they are not going on tour. Maybe mm -hmm. they only have a few songs. Maybe they have an EP project, but they usually have other projects besides that one project. So sure. that's kind of what people deem as like a sync project, a sync band. Um, that being said, what doesn't get discussed is that sync bands, sync projects are usually created by really talented, uh, very professional songwriters and artists. Right. Therefore, they're fucking real. So right. <laughs> um, I, I think everything is real. If you create something, it's a song, it's music. And if you have that expertise of being able to, let's say you write songs for other artists and then you transitioned into, you know, making songs for sync, what's the difference? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, like they already have the skill to be able to write a song that lends itself to someone else's narrative. They're yeah. just reframing it and retaining the rights completely yeah. Yeah. um which to me is just smart business and if a song takes off who's to say they won't tour on it who's to say it won't become a huge project i've seen sure. so many artists do that including myself yeah. um so i think that we get into like weird territory and i, I see a lot of non-music people that work in the music industry that say well you know we just want like an artist that's like touring. I'm like, since when have you seen the pandemic? What artist is like, yeah. like indie artists can't afford to go on tour. Like this yeah. is it guys. This yeah. is yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> no. And that's a really good point. And, and it's, um, 
you know, there was that whole uh, controversy years ago with the quote unquote fake artists uh, of Spotify. And they're like, oh, these are all, you know, uh, all these songs are, are released by fake artists. And it's the same concept. It's the same idea. It's like they're not they weren't AI songs. They weren't robots making these songs. These are actually human beings that were artists that are artists. They were just releasing. They just were so talented that they could actually create in a myriad of genres and and create in all these different production styles and write yeah. in all these different ways. And they knew that their music could fill a need. And that yeah. need just in the Spotify realm was on these certain playlists, like these meditation playlists or these, mm -hmm. you know, um, relaxation or vibe playlists or whatever it was like it was the same thing and there was a lot of pushback yeah. because you're like well they're not real artists it's like well how do you define what a real artist is? artist is it's so subjective i will say the only like gray area or iffy area i do feel about like sync projects or sync bands is when you have a lot of like up-and-coming songwriters that skip the step at getting really good at their craft Mm. And they were they're going for the money grab and they're basically it's like AI spit out the words that they put on their songs. Yeah. It's like yeah. new day, new day together. And you're right. like, maybe <laughs> there's a better, better right. way that we could have uh said that. And it goes right back into authenticity. If it mm. doesn't if you you know, they always say like the person who's playing the piano that has that years of experience in life and one person that's playing it, no, what's the difference? And it's like yeah. there's a huge difference. Like you can feel that difference. And yes. so I think um, I always recommend artists that are trying and songwriters that are skipping that step, put in your, you know, 10,000 hours of work mm -hmm. because uh, it's going to make that sing song that you do create actually resonate. And it's going to come from a real place because mm -hmm. it does feel real to you. And if it like when I'm singing about like being a boss babe or something like I mean it. I'm like, yeah, this is fun. Like I'm having yeah. a good time. Maybe I'm having a glass of Chardonnay when I'm writing it. Like I'm having right. a good time. If yeah. it doesn't feel real, no one's going to connect to it. End of story. Okay, let's talk about that because um, I'm curious your your perspective on AI and uh, how AI music can, if not at our, if it's not already, uh, can affect sync. Um, because you know, I have like. All right, there's. I almost see when we're discussing sync music or just music in sync or music in you know, uh, attached to visual media um, as like, there's, it's almost like a hierarchy. It's like, okay, there are the headline songs that are played in the episode during the montage where it is mm -hmm. front and center and it is a damn good song. Or it's like, this is the final scene and like you remember that song and you're shazamming it in the moment and you're crying and now you listen to the song, <laughs> your favorite song, it's on repeat. Yeah. Like that is the, the top tier, you know? But yeah. then there's the song that's playing in the bar in the background that you can barely even tell is actually happening in the episode. It's like, is that a yeah. real song? Like, what is that? You know, yeah. and it's almost just like ambiance music. And mm -hmm. like, I'm thinking, it was like, well, if they have to pay two or three thousand dollars for this ambiance music, and I'm a production studio or something like that, and I'm looking to like, well, maybe I could put that three grand towards that top line song. Um, mm -hmm. maybe AI could make an ambiance song or something like that. That'll go in the background. Now I'm not advocating for that at all as an <laughs> artist who works with artists. Like, I don't want that to fucking happen. Like, I hope the, I hope the, you know, uh, the writers and the musicians and the actors and everybody on strike and whatever musicians aren't on strike. And that's a whole other topic for a whole other story. <laughs> another, whole other podcast. another day, another day, another day, another day. <laughs> but like, I hope AI does not take in over jobs, but I'm just, you know, it's coming. It's here. There's no avoiding it. I the, the episode that we just released was uh, with the sound, founder and CEO of Boomy Music, which is in an AI music company. So, like, I'm just yeah. curious if you've had these conversations. Is AI going to affect music and sync that you can see? Oh yeah, well, a hundred percent. I co-founded a group called the Web Three Music Rights Group. So it is a group where we discuss these very issues. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, I think. Yes, I do see AI coming into play um, when it comes to like production music and like some background cues. I would say mostly on the instrumental side, I could see that. Um, mm. But it depends on the media and like what kind of content is being delivered at like what level? Like, is it reality TV and they just need like a, a swell? 
sure. But like songs, I mean, I think like background vocals, even though they're in the background, usually still tell a story. Like I, mm-hmm. this is, <laughs> I'm so late, but I've been watching Yellowstone a lot. And, um, you know, the background music that they have, it, it's, it still is really real. So I feel like, you know, it just depends on the content. So I do see some of that coming into play. That being said, where is the AI sourcing the music that it is creating? Because if it's being made from an AI library that somebody created all the sounds and sample packs, et cetera, and then it's like pulling from there, that's a little bit easier. But if it's sourcing from actual original content, what does that look like? Yes. Um, because that's still a human being's, uh, you know, work that they're sourcing it from and that yes. requires licensing and that might be more of a complication for, you know, a company to license and take on that liability. Mm-hmm. Um, so I could see them going directly to like a production music library that is just AI and they're just kind of like issuing right. it out in comparison to like maybe using something else, but I mean, it's going to be a part of our journey. And unfortunately, also like in the States, like your likeness can't really be protected in that regard, your voice, um, mm-hmm. like in other countries. So not yet, it's gonna but, be, yeah. <laughs> not yet uh, but, you know, we're still working on streaming. So yeah. I don't see it getting worked out as quickly as we want <laughs> I know, they to. haven't <laughs> passed laws about social media and that's been around for over 10, 15 years, <laughs> let alone they're going to pass laws about AI tomorrow. I don't know. I mean, I, I think, don't think it so. always comes down to, like what can people like navigate? We would need AI just to be able to navigate AI. Like that right. is like, you know, like we don't. That is a solution like, people are proposing. <laughs> <laughs> as preposterous as it sounds, yeah. So, you know, yeah. I do see it as uh, something that's going to continue to come up. But again, I think you always get what you negotiate. There's always a negotiation negotiation to be had. But mm-hmm. the law is still the law. And there is no wiggle room around that, even if things become normalized. So um, mm. that's how I will navigate it. Um, and I think that the end of the day, like people still want to feel connected to something. Um, I know I do. Like I get more analog every year because I just I'm disenchanted by living my life yeah. um, through the computer and I just want to sit at my piano and I play like a baby giraffe walking for the first time. And that's still more enjoyable. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. And, and this, this just got me thinking Jess, uh, for the first time. Um, so for anyone, cause we haven't even talked about music libraries, but, um, you know, I would caution anyone out there that has licensed their music for a music library or that is working with a music library or a production company or anything like that to really take a look at that contract and redline out strike out anything that says that that this company can use ai to study your works and then create something new and license it without paying you or your permission for you because that's where i yeah. do see it could go is like there are these companies like extreme music or you know whatever there's a bunch of these music libraries out there where they ingest so much music from these work for hire producers and these producers are happy getting paid a couple hundred bucks because they per track per you know production because they can just pump them out nonstop and they don't care and then extreme then owns all the rights or any of these companies owns the rights to it and then music supervisors do can and do go to these companies and they pay pittance for them maybe 500 bucks or something like that you know to to do that but in the future you know because there's still humans involved in every step of that process whereas like in the future this extreme or any of these other companies be like you know what enough with paying these producers 300 bucks for their track like we already have a full library of everything and we're going to tap we're going to like have our ai monitor the uh you know the melancholy uh folder of music melancholy electronic female vocal folder that we have over here and let's pump out you know let's have it study that and now pump out a hundred more tracks that now we own the rights to so like it could move in that direction and we'd want to be very I'm sure that it will. I'm sure that that's probably the biggest threat, to be honest. Um, You know, similar to what the, you know, TV writers are going through right now um, with the streamers. But Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, it's possible. The the only issue with that, encouraging artists to strike that out, 
the likelihood of a company that is hiring someone to do work for hire being okay with that being, uh, you know, sure. removed is unlikely and they're yeah. likely to lose the gig altogether. So, um, you know, that's, that's why it, you know, it sucks sometimes that we can't unionize because that would be something that would be a point that everyone could bring up. Like I'm not against work for hire music. I'm not going to pretend that I don't do work for hire music. Like we're all doing whatever we need to survive. And I don't think it's a dirty word. It's something that I know a ton of songwriters, even big songwriters that talk about never doing work for hire music that I know for a fact do work for hire music. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, I'm never going to lie about that. And, mm -hmm. um, but I know that, you know, there is a risk if I, if, if yeah, you cross something yeah. out like that. For me, I've been working with a lot of those companies for so many years that I might have more negotiation power when it comes to something like that. But, I'm, you know, an up and coming artist that's getting their first um, opportunity to do a work for hire, maybe it's not a few hundred dollars, maybe it's a few thousand dollars. And, they strike that out are they going to lose the gig and then have to work at starbucks possibly well here's a workaround maybe we can encourage sag or the wga to go to bat for us for musicians to be like hey in these contracts just look yeah. out for your musicians too and be like you're not allowed to use any music that has been ai generated in any of your productions let's go wouldn't, let's, yeah. wouldn't that be so nice if others yeah. would look out for the music industry oh my god yeah <laughs> but you know i think when you see a lot of these fights happening i feel like musicians are the first uh to raise their hand and say we support you what can we do to help right um but when it comes to the musicians fighting for their rights uh no one can be found um everyone is too busy um hiding behind their salaries and acting like predators yeah and even in the I music say what i said <laughs> yeah no no 100 percent. and um you know the music supervisors have been trying to unionize and they have been trying to get better working conditions now for a while and they've been on the front yeah. lines striking alongside the wga and, and sag and everything um yeah. because they you know music supervisors uh on like i we i had madonna wade reed on uh the show and she talked about this um months ago long before the strikes were happening but it was kind of like you know they're the only ones on a set on a movie set or a tv show set that are not unionized and that are not actually protected under any labor laws um mm -hmm. they're essentially independent contractors for the studios um but they're the only ones on a set and like you know similarly you know i, I studied why musicians can't unionize quite extensively uh when i was kind of fighting the AB5 California bill, which dealt with um, um, kind of the classification of employee versus independent contractor and all of that, which in, unfortunately in music, it's extremely complicated. Like how we run our business yeah. It's just like, if you hire, um, you know, a producer or a drummer for your production, like the that's, pr that's very typical. That happens. And maybe you pay them a few hundred bucks, like, that is how we operate as musicians. You're now the employer, yeah. but oftentimes yeah. you get hired by yeah. a studio or by, a, you know, you get, you license your music, you get hired that way. And now you're also the employee. And so many musicians both wear the employer employee hat on a daily yeah. basis. It's like, okay, if we do unionize, who are we fighting? Like, is your drummer going to fight you? Are they unionizing against you? It's, Cause you're the it's employer. Also like, uh, also, like when it comes to like the unionization of songwriters, like what are the qualifications to become a part of the union as a professional songwriter that looks so different to so many people? So I right. think there's a lot of complications there. But I, you know, I, I do, you know, not to go on our huge tangent, even though we're there. Like it would be great if, you know, the in the wider industry would understand where you know musicians are coming from and across yeah. the board how that trickles down into all the people that support artists to license music and we're definitely up against like you know budgets going down a lot of times or people not valuing music you're always each production or each media might or each company might value music differently than another mm -hmm. and yeah. so you're always like changing how you negotiate that um i i got a a, a brief today and it made me pretty angry actually and um i'm gonna write an article about it because 
I see this all the time where you see like brands or a production company, maybe a supervisor is being asked this, um, where they ask creators to make a, uh, a version of this cover or maybe it was an original song and, um, if, and if they wanted a woman, they w- wanted them to be BIPOC and they want another female producer. So this is an opportunity to lift up women, mm-hmm. uh, female producers and BIPOC creators. Mm-hmm. Um, and they want them to do a demo on spec. And then if they like the song, they will get a winning fee, but there is no actual fee that they could share. Mm. So if it's an opportunity <laughs> to lift up women and buy right. creators, maybe we should pay them. And so um, I see this all the time. And I think it's not just unique to our industry, but I feel like sometimes we are like on the bottom when yeah. it comes to uh, being able to actually help negotiate for our well-being. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, is that is that fairly typical that when you get briefs and they want you to create a new work to their specs that they're not going to pay for that? They're just like, submit what you can, and then people have to go scramble and, and work for free and, and create this new song for the for the chance and hope that they're going to get the winning fee. The exposure. Yeah, um, and for the exposure. Yeah. Um, we're all on the Oregon, Oregon Trail. We're all died of exposure. But I think that <laughs> <laughs> I think it doesn't happen all the time. Definitely not directly to me, um, I, you know, because I do so much custom music, I just won't do that. Um, but I do get those like cattle calls. Um, and I would say that usually happens more in the licensing space and they're asking um, and they're coming to you and they're like, who are your artists that you have for this? Would they be down to create something? And it, yeah. you know, it puts me in a weird position because I don't have to ask my creators to do something I wouldn't do. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's tough because it's like, but you know, then you have to check yourself and pr- think that, oh, you don't want to be the person that you just uh, yeah. discussed uh, a few minutes back uh, at the start of this with like, is it worth your time? And are yeah. you the one to determine what one of your right. artists would appreciate? Whereas like we were talking about the publishing yeah. company, it's like five grand might not be worth it for them, but it would be worth it for, you know, the and artists. And it's like, and so you do, you bring those opportunities and you say, yeah. I'm sorry, this is kind of what it is. Is that something you'd like to do? Um, sure. So I never gatekeep those opportunities, but yeah. I do want to hold the people creating them accountable that if they're trying to, uh, if music is such a big part of their campaigns, then they can budget demo fees um, and kill yeah. fees and maybe limit the cattle call situation. I get mm-hmm. it that they're up and coming, but what's up and coming? You have plenty of independent artists that have been doing this for 20 plus years that might um, be insulted by that kind of ask. And, and right. you might be missing out on great music that will actually help your campaign. Absolutely. Amen. Uh, <laughs> I'm on board. Uh, yeah. So let's, uh, yeah, I, I hope that that changes. And, you know, and, and like, it, it probably I can, won't. It probably won't. Probably already. won't. And, yeah. you know, and it's like, I, and it's like, where do we pass the blame to? Because, like, you know, I had Lindsay Wolfington on the show uh, and asked, and, you know, discussing her process too. And, like, most music supervisors, love artists, love musicians, want to support them, but they are also constrained by their bosses and their budget. Yeah, 100%. And like, I was looking at, you know, the cue sheets to one of the shows that she uh, was working on. And I'm like, why do half the songs in your show, why are they all from the extreme music library? And like half the songs listed on the cue sheets for this episode are by artists with names in song titles and the other half say extreme music. Like, why did you do that? Like, why aren't you just yeah. licensing? She's like, well, I ran out of money. Like, I don't have the budget for this show to do that. So I needed like five songs that were pr- prominent in, 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 you know, the foreground. And then I needed like yeah. 30 songs that I only had $2,000 for to be in the background. It's like, I ran out of money. And like, what am I supposed to do? Lose my job because I stand on my principles? Oh, I, like, I, think, yeah, I, get it. I yeah. think, I think, you know, and that's kind of where my unique position kind of comes in because I actually empathize with all verticals and yes. the way that everyone participates. So I never come from one place right. of uh, understanding, but yeah, I mean, 
And also they probably have maybe the production house like has a deal or the network has a deal right. with the extreme or, you know, they have these blanket licensing um, situations. And, and that's the only thing sometimes is a bummer is that then you kind of feed the problem and then the artists, they have to do the library stuff and work for higher thing in order to just yeah. participate a little bit in that and at least keep, get their writer share um, mm. of royalties. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, instead of it maybe doing a direct deal uh, for one stop with like, you know, an indie artist. So, right. you know, you always, everyone always wants to work smarter, not harder. No one has time. I think we've established in in our conversation that nobody has time. And so everyone's trying to create a solution to get their job done because they are overwhelmed, have too much on their plate and are underpaid across the board. Absolutely. Well, Jess, I appreciate you taking <laughs> your time to come on the show and discuss um, and, and reveal your wisdom today. Um, yeah. And it's it's so valuable. And, and I know everyone listening to this really appreciates it. Um, if uh, somebody does, if people want to learn more about you or what you do or yeah. how to get in touch or how to have you work for them because they just absolutely fell in love with you and like, oh my gosh, I love how she's <laughs> how she works, how can I get her to pitch my music and, and work? Where yeah. should people go to learn more? Uh, you can go to venicemusic.co. Um, mm -hmm. You can learn about our membership or you can also um, see if the A&R team's interested in you. There's ways to kind of get in touch through our site and what services we offer on the sync side. Uh, if you are an up and coming producer or songwriter artist that um, is looking for uh, you know a label in print, you can go to headbitchmusic.com. We primarily work with um, women and the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, and if you're looking to get into custom work, uh, definitely shoot me an email through my website, headbitchmusic.com and send me your reel or like an example of your work and how you'd like to participate. And I'll definitely keep it in mind. But do not slide into your DMs. You can say <laughs> hi. Just don't send me a link. Like, you don't know what I mean? Don't send you a demo in your DM. Yeah. yeah. Like, send me, like, your astrological sign or, like, a Buffy <laughs> meme. If you, say, if you send me something about Buffy, I will reply. <laughs> <laughs> noted. Noted. Cool. Well, Jess, this has been great. I have one final question yeah. that I ask everybody who comes on the show, and that is, what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? Ooh. What does it mean to make it in the new music business? I think that for me, being able to still be here means I've made it. Um, you know, the longer you stay in it, the longer you'll be in it. So to me, I've made it because I have influence and power to make a difference. And that is my why in the industry, to make it more fair and equitable and safe. Jessica Vaughn, fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Today's episode was edited by Mikey Evans with music by Brassroots District and produced by all the great people at Ari's Take. 